Can you hear me? Yeah, the siren just went off. Okay. Lindsay, where are you right now? I'm in Kiev. Um, things are getting very tense. Um, the siren is going off every few hours, basically. Uh, we're staying in the center of the city, which is quite a target. I'm gonna move into the bathroom, which is the protocol. <laughs> Just what we talk. Well, I'm um, nervous where you're staying. If you're in the center of the city and it's a target, why are you staying there? Um, because all the journalists are staying together um, in one. Let me get my flat jacket. Um, I think this shows how dangerous it is for people who are covering the story. Because, uh, you know, it's sort of when you do this, I think we've learned that you want to be where, like, sort of power in numbers, all the journalists together. Um, so, you know, that's what we've, there's, there, it's not like there's anywhere particularly that's safe. I mean, we were provided, uh, the Russian government sent out sort of more or less uh coordinates or buildings that they're planning on targeting so we've mapped them out and we're a fair distance i mean not a fair distance it depends how accurate their targeting is but there is a great shelter in this hotel so i think that makes a big difference i spent the first sort of probably nine days in the country in the east and i was covering the front line there sort of uh the whole area um, up against the line of contact with the DNR and villages that were being shelled and families kind of packing up their things, people damaged people's homes. There weren't that many civilian casualties, which is amazing at that point. And then the day the war started, we had to make a decision, you know, do we stay in the East and risk getting stuck there or do we try to come back to Kiev? You know, I think what a lot of people don't realize about war is like, 80% of our time goes into logistics and security evaluations. You know, where are the Russians? Are they in the city? Where are they? Can we move safely? I'm kind of anticipating. So those decisions are constantly taking up our time. Let's talk about the capital city where so much focus has been on. Tell me what you've been seeing. Sure. Um, well, every day we're looking at a mass mobilization of civilians, uh, people who are offering themselves up as volunteers. You know, I've seen everything from teachers. You know, I met this young woman, Julia, who was uh, crying as she was literally going to the volunteer center, had been handed a gun two days prior, didn't even really know how to use it. But she just felt it was her, her duty for her country to go and at least try and fight. Yesterday, I was was at this incredible center, which was like a base where they basically train people up in two, three days from everything from intelligence to tank mining and, you know, operating a gun. And, and it, it, there was really sort of an entire system going on at this base. Um, every day it's getting more and more tense. Um, the sirens are going off more and more. Yesterday I visited a shelter with women and children in a hospital. They all had sick children. It was uh, a few dozen mothers and their kids uh, living in a basement of a hospital. I mean, it was pretty grim. The first few days I was here, there were several residential buildings that were hit. Had and most so, had people had people evacuated those buildings? I saw no, those photos I mean, and I wondered, if there were people inside. So if they have a place to go, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have have moved west. A lot of people have moved their families out of the capital, but some people just don't have anywhere to go. And we've seen the scenes at the Polish border. You know, this is sort of the tragedy of war is that you have these poor civilians. I mean, people don't often have money to leave. They don't have the resources to leave. And so I think in the center um, where we are, there are certain obvious targets like security buildings. We just hope that the Russians in their grand plan keep in mind that there are civilians and, and to try and spare us. And there are journalists. It's incredible to see the people of Ukraine taking up arms, cab drivers, restaurant owners, teachers. Tell us a little bit about those people and what is motivating them to risk their lives to defend their country. It's just incredible. 
I mean, I think democracy. I think these are people who they've been able to thrive in the last few years and they've, they have lives, they have businesses, they have a certain amount of freedom of speech. They feel united as Ukrainians. They have a leader who has been in amazing and strong and speaking up and defiant. And, you know, I think that that has also been inspiring. And I think they've also endured eight years of war. And so there is a certain tolerance, but I think Ukrainian Ukrainians have really come together and the more Putin pushes, the more the Ukrainians unite. And I think that that is pretty inspiring to see. Despite their best efforts though, the Russian military is far superior. There is no Ukrainian air force. I mean, there are tanks rolling into Kyiv. Are people thinking it's just a matter of time before the Russians overtake even the most determined Ukrainians? Publicly, they are voicing nothing, but they do not want to live in a Putin-controlled Ukraine. You know, that they do not want to be part of Russia. They want, you know, they will fight. Are they frustrated that the international community has not done more to come to their aid? Obviously, Germany is sending weapons, the U.S. How are I mean, they? It's a little late. Yes, that's what I was going <laughs> to say. The city's under siege. I mean, it's right. like, you know, there's one bridge open. I mean, I'm not sure what everyone was thinking. I mean, Putin did not try to hide his plans. So most people are not focusing on that. I think that they're still hoping something might happen, but I, I think they're just kind of, the president has told them, like, we're here on our own. No one is helping us. And I think they just kind of, that's it. I mean, at some point, the world leaders have to act. I mean, how long can we sit around? And if you don't have journalists on the ground, if you don't have journalists holding Putin accountable for what he's doing, then it's just going to be Russian-led propaganda. I mean, I think it's very important for people to see the reality.